When US President Franklin D. Roosevelt started the Manhattan Project, it began a chain of events that would change the world forever. Oppenheimer's biggest regret. The birth of the atomic bomb. Welcome to Lab 360. It's time to explore. The 20th century was the era of physicists, with Niels Bohr coming up with the model of an atom, Einstein with his theory of relativity, and Max Planck with quantum physics. They altered the world of science forever. But we begin with the periodic table. So, the periodic table is a sequence of nuclear counts of protons. Hydrogen has one proton, helium, two protons, lithium, three protons. Each nuclei of an atom contains energy waiting to be released. But how does one access that energy? In the late 1800s, we learned that some atoms are not stable. For example, a version of uranium is unstable because it has 92 protons in the nucleus, but has a different number of neutrons. When the number of neutrons varies, it is called an isotope. Remember, it's the atom, but with a different number of neutrons, which changes its properties. So, the unstable version of uranium spontaneously breaks into two atoms, leading to release of energy that's called radioactivity. When an element is radioactive, it is splitting on its own and releasing energy. While energy is good, it also becomes hot and releases tremendous heat. This splitting of an atom is called fission. Moving to the other end of the periodic table, we have hydrogen, which cannot be broken as it has only one proton. But you can combine the elements together to form a heavier element. When this is done, the mass of the heavier element is less than the sum of the parts. Now hold your horses. Where did the mass go? We fall back to Albert Einstein. No. Not him exactly, but his infamous equation. E equals to mc square. Which means when you lose mass, you gain energy on the other side of the equation. To put it in simple words, you can put lighter atoms, combine them together to make heavier atoms, and energy gets released. Sounds similar. Our sun does this. So you combine two atoms of hydrogen to get helium, and helium combines to give carbon. This process requires high energy, so thermo, nuclear because the nucleus of an atom is involved, fusion as you are fusing them together. A thermonuclear fusion. Coming back to our sun, it converts hydrogen into helium, releasing energy, giving us heat and warmth for everyday life. So, at the high end the atom is split, which releases energy which uranium does on its own. That's fission. Whereas hydrogen requires high temperature and high pressure for coming together, and that's fusion. When uranium monstably splits, it releases a neutron, and that neutron goes ahead and splits another atom, then another, then more, going one, then two, four, then eight, and then 16 leading to an out-of-control chain reaction. That's what an atomic bomb is. It contains an isotope of purifying uranium, crammed together to initiate a reaction using a trigger, causing a tremendous release of energy instantaneously. Disturbingly amazing, isn't it? The next thought that comes to one's mind which is more powerful, fusion or fission. The bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were fission bombs, which equaled 10 to 20 kilotons of TNT. And if one type of bomb wasn't enough to level a city, we went ahead and created the hydrogen bomb, which are fusion bombs capable of unleashing megatons of it. The pulse of a nuclear bomb will not only incinerate whatever comes in its line of sight, but then comes the blast wave which will annihilate anything that remains. 
similar to thunder, which moves at the speed of light, and the blast comes at the speed of sound. During the development of the bomb, a calculation was made. What if the chain reaction would continue in the atmosphere? The atmosphere contains water molecules, which consists of hydrogen, as well as the sea. Would this chain reaction incinerate the seas and air? Apparently not. Speaking of hydrogen, CERN has been developing something polar opposite to it. The stuff of science fiction, that is actually a science fact. It is an antimatter, the rarest and most expensive material in the known universe. Our universe is made up of tiny particles of matter, and according to theory, every particle of matter has an equivalent antiparticle. Just like an evil twin, almost the same in all aspects. But the problem is, there is almost none of it detected in the universe, which is a blessing because matter and antimatter cannot coexist. Because if they ever meet, they will annihilate each other and release tremendous energy and other particles, not knowing what harm they might cause. Fiction assumes it to be used as the ultimate energy source to run civilizations and travel at light speed across the cosmos. And it might be true. If one were to actually crash matter and antimatter, it would produce a high amount of energy. But if you take a scientific point of view, the energy put in making the antimatter does not match the energy output. It's a complete loss. Unless we become efficient in producing it. But the antimatter factory has developed the evil twin of the simplest element in the universe. Anti-hydrogen. By looking at how anti-hydrogen behaves, Particle physicist Jeffrey Hangst hopes to solve the universe's biggest mysteries. Why is there no antimatter left in the universe? Shouldn't antimatter have been created in equal amounts in the Big Bang? And shouldn't they all clash and cancel each other, leaving nothing behind? Jeffrey's project is testing to see an explanation to see if there is an imbalance in the anti-hydrogen. If it does not behave the same way as hydrogen, to check if gravity affects it differently. They are going to use a machine called the Alpha G machine, where the G stands for gravity. This device is going to help them figure what happens when antimatter is dropped in a gravitational field of the Earth. The unanticipated outcome would be the anti-hydrogen goes up instead of going down, which will completely revolutionize physics or science itself. This is the future that will upturn the apple cart, just like the atomic bomb did. Or will it be another regret? What are your thoughts? Drop in your comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to Lab360, because together, we will explore.